Uh, to most of you, I'm sure I'm a strange face, so I probably should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeff Stinson, and I'll be uh, joining the, the faculty of the college here this uh, summer. And so I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm coming from the Fargo, North Dakota, Moorhead, Minnesota area, which uh, some of you know. I, I'm the player to be named later in the trade for Dr. Kent, who will be uh, <laughs> relocating there. But I, I have been asked to pass along. If you're moving in July, you should prepare to turn the heat on. Um, before you get there, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to introduce our second speaker today who's the uh, CEO of Brooks Sports. Um, on, a, on a side note, I, I'm really excited because for about the past eight or nine years I like to run and I've been running in Brooks shoes and just I think they're, they're fabulous and so I'm excited to have uh, Jim here to, to discuss some of the uh, company initiatives. But Jim Weber uh, joined Brooks Sports as president and CEO in April of 2001 and has an impressive track record of successfully building brands in the sport and leisure industry. Uh, Brook Sports uh, is currently <coughs> leading the pack, has reinvented itself, uh, focusing on high performance running. So, so getting that niche, a uh, recent article, and I'm not sure which publication it was in, talking about focusing on, on the segment who runs, I believe, 50 or, or more times uh, per year. I sort of fall in that category, I think. Um, uh, Jim received his MBA with high distinction from the Tuck School at Dartmouth College, but perhaps more importantly uh, is a fellow Golden Gopher from the University of Minnesota. <laughs> so I'm excited to introduce our second speaker, Jim Weber. Thank you, Jeff. Well, um, good morning, everybody, and thanks for inviting me. This is a great opportunity to, one, come to Syncadia. What a, what a great spot. Um, we've enjoyed it for the last evening with rain and all, but it's absolutely gorgeous and it's great to hear the story behind it. Um, but also just to talk to you a little bit about the Brooks story. And so um, as I talked to Dean Savoyan about um, Brooks and as it relates to sustainability, um, we've got first and foremost kind of a niche um, brand story. And, um, and it's, a, it's a lot of who we are and it actually leads to the sustainability story. So, First, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Brooks. It's a great brand strategy case study, I think, and, uh, and one that's more common than the Nikes of the world because there's only one big gorilla in every market, and there are a lot of people that are trying to find their way, and we're certainly one of those. Then I want to share with you some of the, uh, the things that we've achieved on the green side and, and a lot about what we haven't. So to start with, standing out in the crowd, I mean, that's, that's Brooks. We're in a land of giants, um, and let me tell you a little bit about the story. First, we're almost a 100-year-old company. We've been around since the uh, teens. We were building baseball spikes and football spikes, what was then athletic footwear in the 20s and 30s, and all the way up through um, to today's time. But we had lost our way. We once had momentum and authenticity. We, ha we had some of the best running shoes when the jogging boom began in the 70s and, uh, and coming into the 80s. But we found ourselves coming into this decade um, number six or seventh at everything. You know, sort of out there, but, but not all that relevant. Um, not really all that important. In fact, no one would have missed us if, uh, if we had disappeared. We were on the shelf, but, but we were just not all that, that relevant. So we hit the reset button. And obviously in this area, that's control, alt, delete. We were looking for a game we could win at. And our motivator, you know, kind of like getting sued. I mean, it's funny how tough times really, really create opportunity later on. We were out of money. We were bankrupt. We had, we had tens of millions of dollars of debt owed to the banks. Um, they weren't going to lend us any more. They cut the loans off. You know, the call came in the afternoon saying, you're bouncing checks. This isn't going to happen. So, so we were out of money. We were very motivated to find a path. No more cash for payroll, inventory, et cetera. And um, the first thing we did in, in, a, in a series of, of, you know, kind of months was to look at the market in a very, very critical way. And, you know, when you look at markets, you can really, you can really slice it very finely. And understanding the customer is something that, that is, is sort of a journey. You never quite get there. So this is the athletic footwear market. Um, barbecue shoes. The truth of the matter is there's a lot more running shoes, basketball shoes, and, and court shoes that are sold for casual wear than are sold to play sports. That's the truth. And, and this became most of our business as Brooks came into this decade. Our sweet spot was a $30 athletically styled price point family footwear shoe. We call them barbecue shoes or lawnmower shoes because that's what people do in them. 
They don't really go running in them. And that was the core of our marketplace. You're selling a bit of your brand heritage at a cheap price. And so this wasn't working for us anymore. We, had, we were losing money at this. We were, again, sixth or seventh at it. And so we decided to go back to the basics of running. And what drove us to this was that in sporting goods, it's kind of, I think, the major leagues, leagues of marketing. I, I really believe that because it's not just an ad campaign. It's not just a brand positioning. Your number one marketing program is your product. Because for an athlete, an enthusiast, that product experience is their whole brand experience. It's sort of like experiencing Suncadia. You can read the brochure, but you have to be here to experience it. Pro sporting goods product, sporting goods equipment is the same thing. And uh, if you think about some of the greatest brands in sport, you can trace it back to a, to a performance product that an enthusiast found, fell in love with Callaway as, a, as maybe the most authentic, credible brand in golf. You can trace back to the Big Bertha and the fact that that club hit the ball 20 yards further off the tee, everybody in the foursome knew it. It wasn't an ad campaign. So we, we decided to go back to product for all those reasons, and, and, and through that came intense focus. We had two shoes at that time. This is 2000, 2001, that worked. We had the Beast and the Addiction, which were motion control shoes that were performance shoes that people that, that needed you know, the right shoe because they were putting miles in knew they needed it. it was a, they were niche products, but they were the, the, the only products we had that retailers really weren't sending back. And so we built off those two shoes. We created an R&D lab that was focused on runnability. Again, we were going we were gonna define our product as, as runnable. If you bought Brooks, you knew it was going to be runnable, which was not the case. Over 50% of our sales were in barbecue shoes. But we thought there was an absolute opportunity to be the only brand that if you bought our product, whether it was a short, a hat, a pair of socks, or a shoe, it was going to be runnable. If you hit mile 15, not that you would, but if you did, you wouldn't blister up. You wouldn't be miserable. So, so the R&D lab uh, began that. And we were going to define ourselves by what we sold, how we sold it, and to who. And, and really, brands are defined that way, especially in the early going. And we treated Brooks um, much like a startup company like we were starting from scratch, which to a, a degree we are. But as part of this focus, we left 40% of our sales behind. In 2000, our biggest customer was Big Five Spor Sporting Goods. We were at $29.99 on average price, and, and they, were, they were our far and away our largest customer. We don't sell them today. And the moment of truth came as we were looking at the strategy. We knew we had to do it. It's not like we had a lot of options, which um, you know, it's great to be uh, wise and thoughtful and you chose the right strategy among 14 options. The truth is we didn't have very many options. But uh, I became the fourth CEO in two years. I uh, decided to take the job. There was a pool on how long I would last. So the confidence in the strategy was absolutely <laughs> immense as we, uh, we embarked on it. So fast forward to today, um, we've rewired the business. We've, ha we've, we've had great business results, but more importantly, I think we have a very well positioned brand. So paint the picture for that a little bit for you. When we repositioned our product line, we jettisoned over 50% of the SKUs and focused just on performance running products. We did the same in distribution. So we got rid of those price point customers because we weren't making that product anymore. And we went foremost and firstly to specialty running shops. And there are about 700 of these in the US. Um, and this was a radical sort of move at the time because Walmart and the Walmartification of America was was putting all the big box guys under pressure and putting all the little guys out of business. But you know, we saw in enthusiast sporting goods, there's a, there's a place for specialty. There's a place for people that are enthusiasts. They go there to find the new product. When you have a hobby, by age 30, 35, you go to where the good stuff is and where people are that, that know about new product and such and so forth. So we believed it was going to stay uh, credible. But there, there's been a running renaissance. I'll talk a little bit more about that, maybe a fitness boom. And these people you know, are trusted because they're, they're, they're credible editors of product. They bring in only the best stuff, and they won't sell you know, what doesn't work, what isn't runnable. And they're great at fit. And most people haven't figured out that they need a great shoe, but they know they need the right fitting shoe. So you know, that's, that's something that's benefited us. So we've tripled the size of our business with these people, and, and they've become uh, almost 80% of our business, and that's where we're building our brand. Um, but the big idea was to focus on the run, and this is our purpose. When we've shifted this strategy, 
Um, we focused around a purpose of inspiring people to run and be active. That's our, that's our entire mantra. And the power of that is what it, what it you know, sort of forces you not to do. You know, the, be the biggest decisions you often make in business are what not to do, and it's really true. Um, so all the way along, we're, we're working hard to kind of build this business and move it forward, but every day we're creating brand. Did this go out a little bit? I'll do this. Maybe that'll help. Um, every day we're creating brand. What this really did for us, though, is, is create an authenticity and a realness around the core of our brand, and it's attracted a certain type of employee. It's attracted runners back to this company. That's, what, that's where it started to begin with, but now we're attracting employees that want to be part of a running company. And then, you know, finally, what it also did is it forces us to ask the right questions on product. You know, we're in an industry, especially back six, seven years ago, that was about, you know, eye candy, something cool. Give me something cool. Show me some technology. And that was that was what was driving our category. And and we've just, we're going to be we want to be innovative, but it's got to be purposeful. We we are not going to put eye candy on the shoes. So you know, this is this is really driven all of our R and D our R and D efforts. That runnability quotient is key. And you know, great product looks great. In in the early going, we wore ugly product is kind of a badge of honor. Yeah, it's ugly, but it works. You should, you know, just buy it. And, and obviously, great design looks great, but, but out of asking the right questions came some new technology um, and our new midsole, Mogo. When you think about a shoe, a running shoe in particular, there's actually a lot going on in the shoe. You know, it has to cushion and dampen on, on heel strike. It has to transition and flex, or your foot will be dead after mile 15. And you have to have good cushioning and propulsion phase. It has to fit. It can't, it can't you know, crimp anywhere in the up. It's got to do a lot of stuff. But half of what's going on is in the midsole. It's like the engine, the chassis, the drivetrain. It's all going on in the midsole. And so we engineered a material. We spent three or four years in, in the lab and 40 iterations of, of this compound. And we were trying to balance cushioning, first feel, durability, you know, the stability uh, um, elements that has to go on in the shoe. You know, temperature stability on 150 degree pavement and 10 below zero weather, good spring rate and resiliency in, in toe off, and then finally environmentally friendly, which I'm going to talk more about. Um, and we delivered against it, and it's very exciting for us. The uh, next iteration of that is making it more environmentally friendly. But, you know, what really it is all about is helping runners run. We get a lot of letters. We get a lot of letters on social responsibility, on environmental sustainability, but we also get a lot of letters from runners who basically say, thanks for making great shoes, you saved my life. You know, I went to the doctor, I've hit 40, 42, I've been a lifelong runner, and he gave me two choices, quit running or buy Brooks, and, and I can run again. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's what really drives us, and it's, it's you know, in a way we're sort of selling, you know, seat belts and airbags, um, which isn't that exciting, but it is about running, you know, longer, farther, faster, and, and hopefully into old age. It's it's a lifestyle, so that's what we're all about. We've also reinvested in the sport. You know, we, uh, as it were, a small brand, and we can't out authenticity Nike or Asics or Adidas. We compete against some of the greatest brands in uh, the consumer world, but we reinvested in in track and field and cross country. We sponsor a lot of high school oriented um, um, situations, and we also sponsor an Olympic development program called the Hanson's Brooks Distance Project. And it's, it's a true Cinderella story. Um, it's an old school team development program that went away 20 years ago with, the, with money coming into the sport and personal coaches and, and American distance running went by the wayside. We're gonna compete this year for a medal and there's three men on the team. Last year, uh, last time around, one of our women hit silver. Um, but this time around, we've actually got a shot in men's and Brooks has put Brian Sell on the team, which we're very excited about. Um, so it's an investment in the sport, um, probably unlike a lot of other sports um, categories. Running is, is the, the, the business is not the sport. It's, it's really a marketing uh, strategy. You know, we don't make any money in team uniforms and spikes and the like, but it's an important investment in the sport and brings our brands into the high schools with the kids. Um, you know, marketing, it's... Uh, you know, it's, it's right around about 10.15 today. Nike has outspent us in marketing for the entire year already today. We have to do things differently. 
So we're a grassroots company. We're absolutely a grassroots company. We're, I would say we're not marketing driven, we're, we're product driven, but we try to be where runners are. So this is Chicago Marathon Expo, um, you know, running races. Uh, I think there were 9 million finishers last year in the U.S. and it's continuing to grow. So we show up at over 400 races a year. Um, we're at the Expo. We try to be memorable so that porta potty in the middle of the booth is well known to any runner that does an event. That's our changing room. If you want to check out some shorts or a top, and people got a kick out of that. But you know, we're trying to uh, we're trying to connect with runners where there are they are. It's also a great source of marketing research, and we do some research. But there's no substitute, you know, for being elbow to elbow with your customers. I mean, there's there's 30,000 of them out any given weekend at one race or another. And uh, you're standing at the finish line, you're getting a sense of their stories and, and why and how they run and what they're all about. Um, so that's a great opportunity for us. The business results have been great for us. You know, we, as we repositioned in uh, 2000, 2001, we got rid of about 40% of those sales. So we've actually grown our core business at 28% compound now for the last seven years. And, uh, but more importantly, our brand is, is just much stronger from any angle you measure it. We're about three times the size we were. We're in these specialty running shops, which is kind of the, the battleground for performance running because those shops are, the most, for the most part, the center of the running community at where they, where they are. Um, we're now the number two brand. We're actually larger than Nike, Adidas, New Balance, um, Mizuno, Saucony. The only brand that's larger than us in that channel is Asics, and, and we're running hard against them. They're, they make great product. Um, and we've also been profitable, and, and we're very proud of that. I think it's very, you know, the challenge is to do all three. Great businesses do all three. They lead their niche. They're, they grow, and, and they make money. And having been um, on the other side of that, we, we you know, we, we've worked very hard to deliver against this, and, and you never can spend enough in product development, and you can never spend enough in marketing. So we, we shelve more great ideas than than we can stand, but you know, it's, it's part of being a, a solid company. In 2006, we were bought by Berkshire Hathaway. Um, they were actually our third owner in the last couple of years. We were bought by Russell, and then Russell was bought by Berkshire Hathaway. Um, so we're not sure uh, Warren's running in our shoes yet, but we know he likes our business. So where do we go from here? You know, we think we've got now a, a nice little company that's performing well, but we're very, very well positioned in this category. Now what, where to? You know, our whole strategy is three million new runners over the next five years. We think we can double our business again over the next five years. And running is absolutely on fire. And it's not this presentation, but we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, what, what's happening in the society out there, what's driving people. And there's an absolute fitness phenomenon going on right now. It's a quest to stay young among baby boomers. Women, Title IX worked in the colleges. It created a whole generation of women that are going to stay active into their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So, you know, if you if you're not addressing women athletes and the active women's lifestyle in the last 10 years, you're not growing in sporting goods. It's been a key phenomenon in almost every category. <laughs> certainly, is driving the running category. And then, you know, just uh, there's something special about it in terms of the community, the causes related to it, and the like. So, you know, our whole focus, and we're wiring the whole company to it, is around adding three million new runners to our brand. That's our goal. And that would, um, that would still make us one of the smallest companies in our industry. So we don't have to ruin anybody's day to do that. So from here, I'd like to go on and talk a little bit about our green initiatives. And you know, um, in late 2006, um, we sort of woke up and we just said, you know, we've, we, we got to focus on this. You know, we'd, we'd gone through a survival stage. We'd, we'd come through kind of a growth stage and, and really getting our legs underneath us in terms of who we were as a brand. And we started to talk about, you know, sustainability and, and um, so on and so forth. But, you know, it really came from the run. And, uh, you know, we were, we were hearing a little bit about it from Chris earlier that it, it came from your, your customer demand. For us, we've, we've gotten a lot of letters over the years from runners, but th this is what the run is all about. It's fundamentally an outdoor experience. It's fundamentally... Um, you know, a whole body experience for most people um, as they get older and, uh, and they want clean air and they need clean water. So, you know, we approach it as something that's essential. It's, it's, it's got to come from our DNA and, and we've got to live it. And, you know, we're in an area that we have a lot of people that care dearly about it personally, 
but it's also a brand impairment imperative. So, you know, for us, you know, we're driven to positively impact people's lives. We think the run does that. We think the run can absolutely change people's lives with a losing weight or raising money for a great cause or in honor of, of, of a relative or friend. Um, that's a key part of this, but we're also, you know, making a conscious commitment um, to minimize our effect on the earth. And we've had a lot of discussion around this because at the end of the day, we believe if we don't make a great shoe, we're toast. I mean, the first thing people want from Brooks is great running gear. So that's the business we're in. And if we don't do that, it doesn't matter how sustainable we are. Um, we're not going to survive as, as an organization. So first and foremost, it has to be a great shoe, but we want to do it with minimum impact on the environment. So, you know, on the uh, live side, in addition to just, you know, kind of celebrating and hopefully inspiring the run, um, we've got a code of conduct and uh, corporate social responsibility program that I'll talk a little bit more about that's a key part of that. And um, that's expected, but, but we're also um, doing absolutely everything we can to, to execute and live on that level with all of our factory partners. And then we have a community uh, involvement program called Run Because that I'm going to talk about. On the environmental side, it's about materials and it's about manufacturing. So I'm going to share a couple stories with you. I, I have to say up front, you know, Michael's going to come up and talk about REI's efforts. You know, we feel like we are in absolutely the first or second inning on this whole program. Um, we've gone after some low-hanging fruit. Um, we've got a group of students from the Bainbridge Institute that right now are doing a project around measuring our, our carbon footprint. Um, we know it's ugly. Um, airfare alone, we're a, we're a global company. We have 45% of our sales outside of the U.S. We have subsidiaries in Europe. We have 30 employees in, in Asia on the factory side. So we're a mess with airfare. Um, we know that already. But um, So we feel like we're just getting started. You know, this MOGO um, material, this midsole material that I talked about, one of the most exciting things about it was the, uh, the improvement that we made on waste reduction. I won't go into detail, but shoes were basically like Christmas cookies. You created an EVA um, um, uh, sliced bun, actually. It, it was a four by four foot thing. You sliced it and your cookie cut out a midsole, and then you, and then you compression molded. And you can see, you know, you threw away basically everything on the outside. You threw it away. So we went to pellets. We re-engineered this whole process. It's completely controlled. There's zero waste out of this thing unless the process gets out of control. And that was a major improvement. And, and I think a lot of footwear has gone this way, but we were one of the first to do it. We went from, I think, eight steps to eight, from 18 steps to eight. And so not only do we get a much higher quality product, but a lot less waste. Um, the, the, the midsole is a, is a foam structure that basically has air cavities in it, and you're creating that, which is what gives you the cushion and the dampening and the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the stability elements to that. So we've been working with a, um, a company that had made an additive to create more space um, in those areas so that it would degrade faster. Microbes munch on plastics, but it takes a thousand years for many plastics and, and EVA is midsole is, is essentially a plastic material. So, you know, running shoes hopefully, you know, get used well for several hundred miles, then hopefully get reused to mow the lawn, and then hopefully get reused, you know, through a, a, a pass-along program to somebody that can't afford a new pair of shoes. But at some point, they get thrown away. And so we were trying to get after this landfill situation, and and have it, you know, return to methane, which in Europe, in the landfills, they're capturing that methane and they're, they're using it for energy. We're not doing that here yet, but, but this was a first step. You know, we're not, we hadn't solved, you know, we hadn't cured cancer here. That's for sure, but it was a first step because running shoes do end up in landfills. So with this additive, this is the difference in, in uh, one-year conditions. We've taken it from about 1,000 years down to 20 years and it's essentially saved about 30 million pounds in a landfill over a 20 year period. So, you know, the other thing that we've done, and, and uh, the outdoor industry has really led this, REI being a big part of that, is we've created this as open technology. So it's actually going into, it's, it's, it's coming into our warehouse right now, we'll ship to retail July 1, but we've done a lot of work on the testing and the process side and, and how to make this work. We're going to share that with other footwear companies, and we've already got a half a dozen that are interested. So, um, which is, it, it's not, it's not about a marketing campaign. At the end of the day, it's about the earth, basically. So, 
you know, we didn't think there was any other way to go about that. We've also tackled the box. You know, we do almost 4 million of these a year, so it adds up. It's amazing how it adds up. 100% re recycled materials, soy inks. We've got silver in our palettes, so there's no heavy metals in those silver inks anymore. Um, it's amazing the impact you can make if you pay attention. 14,000 trees, 5.6 million gallons of water. Um, big improvement there. You know, we, uh, we posted all of this on our web. We created a spot called the Green Room. You know, we're trying, you know, not to wear it on our sleeve because we, you know, our laundry is not yet pristine. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, but the neat thing about what we've done here is we've, we've totally engaged our employees. So there's, a, there's sort of this organic energy going on throughout our company, and we're working on it all over the place. We're working on everything from employee commutes to the office situation. Our warehouse distribution center has made tremendous inroads, reusing, corrugated, and the like. Um, we're making a lot of progress, but um, we've got a long way to go. But we do believe that, uh, that our customers are, are going to expect it. A little bit on corporate social responsibility. Um, this is a big challenge for all of us, but I think you know, and the factories that we're in are, are typically um, um, more significant, higher quality factories. We're not selling $12 shoes at Walmart. And, you know, there you're chasing low cost. And not that Walmart has issues in the factory, but, you know, we're, we're, this is a pretty high make product. So we're in fantastic factories for the most part. Um, but we launched this program a decade ago. You know, we're taking it a step further, I believe. We're really working on educating, training, and, and to manage to code in contact with our factories. We can't typically flip factories on a dime. We've been in the same shoe factories for over a decade now because quality and the know-how and the craftsmanship is such a key part of it. Um, but we're really working hard to educate them. We do regular audits on all of our factories every six to 12 months. De the frequency depends on uh, kind of where they stand. Working hard, we have conferences that we host to identify root causes and, and drive continuous improvement. We actually have a great success story out of this in one of our apparel factories um, where you can move a little bit more freely. We had actually told uh, one of our major apparel factories that we were going to exit because they had some discrepancies and really weren't remedy them on, on overtime pay and things like that. And they actually blinked. We couldn't believe it. You know, they actually blinked and they, they redressed it. They came back to us, basically begged us to stay. And we think we benefited the 600 employees in that factory, which was, I think, a rare win, but uh, particularly for a company of our size. Um, but the team was very excited about that. A little bit on Run Because. This is an umbrella program that we created. You know, it starts with, with these 400 events we're in. Every one of those events has a charity attached to it. So we feel like when we're supporting these events, if we can amplify the voice of that event, we can help charities at every place we go. But Every employee has uh, about $300 worth of product they can donate to a charity that they're associated with. That's employee driven. Um, we have a, a day of uh, paid community service activity that employees are taking on in groups. And then we have a committee. Um, we get uh, dozens of requests every, every week as well. And quarterly, we look at those against a criteria and, and uh, support those whenever we can. So, that's a quick overview of Brooks, um, our strategy, and, and some of the things we're doing on the green side. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, you know, what I'd, I'd come back to is, is one of the most exciting things about being at Brooks is, you know, we've been able to focus. And so we're, we're really working hard to build into the DNA of this company, build into the DNA of this brand, this run happy spirit. It is all about the run. And that's a powerful opportunity to have. It, running is a huge category. Um, but it's allowed us to, you know, to focus on product in a very intense way. And, you know, we can't do a $300 million ad campaign uh, to compete with New Balance Nike. But with a focused team of people on the product side, we can go head to head with them. And we are. We are. So, so that's, been, that's been great. The other side of it is we've, we've always been kind of a glass half full company and a group of people. And I think brands in many, many respects are over time a reflection of the people that drive them. You cannot fool people over time. You just can't. And so, you know, we've worked really hard to, to um, continue to reinforce this culture and uh, have some fun along the way. You know, we're, we're definitely a more inclusive brand. You know, in so many ways, you know, Nike is, is, is just such a powerful brand that we all, anybody that's ever played sport can associate and affiliate with a competitive spirit 
that they embody as a brand. Um, but in a sense, you know, they kind of captured it best at the Atlanta Olympics with that billboard that said, you don't win silver, you lose gold. And, and so we're kind of the other side of that. Um, it's about being out there, and, and that's really what running is all about. So life's too short not to drink in the journey, and we try to live that um, as a company and as a group of people. And that's kind of the spirit that's, that's uh, engaging the running community right now as well. So, so I'll be glad to answer any questions or comment further on any parts of this that you might be interested in more. Yeah. Well, you know, it's one of those little um, underneath the radar programs that we've been doing for 20 years. So we do. We, we actually have a direct mail program to 80,000 sports medicine professionals, physical therapists, orth orthopedic docs, um, you know, podiatrists, that whole community. We go to the podiatrist conference, and they're the people that do a lot of the orthotics and, and deal with injuries and foot problems. So that community is a community that we've marketed to now for, for over 20 years. They know us well as a brand. Nike never goes there, and, and partly because I think it's, it's, it's a little bit lab coat, white coatish. it's not real cool, and, and they, they address a lot of people you know, that, are, that are in the 40, 50 range um, that just have problems that develop over time. But we've been there forever. Um, ASICs and New Balance do a little bit of that as well, but that's an area that we've worked really hard on. So, you know, we'll, we'll do a couple direct mailers to them a year. We'll sell them product at a discount. And um, we'll also educate them on the state of uh, technology and footwear. They know feet, but, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to educate them on what's happening in shoe design and, and the kinds of shoes we're building so they trust our product. And, um, and we actually create prescription pads that some use and some don't for a shoe. So we actually also create a grid <coughs> of all of the footwear in the industry in specific categories for people's individual needs based on foot type and pronation, not just with our product on it, but with all of the competitive product on it. So we're, we're doing our best to educate them on the state of, of things in footwear. And that story I told was exactly, you know, what we live for. I mean, our, our product really is sold a pair of feet at a time, and, and the sports medicine community has been a key audience for us. It was probably one of our major marketing programs six, seven years ago. It's part of what we do now, but we've never left it. They're very influential. Yes? You know, I have, uh, I have a strong opinion about that question. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think when you think about sporting goods equipment, it's the product first. You can't, you just can't fool people at the enthusiast level. And I came from a sporting goods equipment background when I came to Brooks. Footwear and apparel is a, is a bit hybrid, you know, because a lot of people wear it casually and the business is big on the casual side. What we did, we caught everybody sleeping because we treated it as equipment. We treated, we gusseted our shorts so they wouldn't creep up and blister you. We, you know, we created um, better socks and, and we just, we, we sweated the details on, on comfort and performance and people looked at it a little bit differently. I even believe that's true in a lot of categories like take Starbucks. You know, I think, I think when they first came out, it was a better cup, cup of coffee than most of us had had in a long time because we were making it the old fashioned way. So, you know, product, the product experience isn't the only way to get there, but it's certainly, I, I think, um, that's a, it's a better niche opportunity because when you think about the marketing side, you know, the Internet's opened up a whole new opportunity. It's a resurgence of choice and iTunes and the long tail and, and all that. I, there's never been a better opportunity to build niche brands and, and even from a marketing point of view. But, but I think bringing something different to the consumer today is, is just essential. You know, we were in a situation where the world did not need another shoe. The retailer did not need another. You go into any shoe store, any athletic store, and there's a whole wall of shoes. You don't have a clue why one versus another. So 
you know, I, I think it's more important than ever before that you, you bring a point of difference, a reason for being, why are you relevant? You know, and that's the question that, you know, that's why there was a pool on me because, you know, I, I, people thought that, that, you know, it was beyond the, the opportunity to create a relevancy with the Brooks brand was gone. But, but to me, it's all about that relevant, you know, that relevant question. Why are you relevant? Because, you know, it's not really about awareness anymore. There are a lot of brands that have great brand awareness, um, but uh, they're failing. And two are Ford and Chevrolet. You know, great brands, right? From every metric, if you talk about brands, you recognize, but, but people are buying Toyotas and Hondas, you know? And, and so there's something there on, on the point of difference, the, the relevant part of it. So we've, we, our whole approach has been the most relevant, to be the most relevant brand of runners. So if you're not a runner, you may, you may never even find us. But, but if we could be the most relevant brand of runners, this is a billion dollar idea. Because the market's that big. So, so it's not for lack of opportunity. So we're doing it with product. We're absolutely competing with product. And product is, is where we can go nose to nose with anybody with a fraction of the resources because we've got great people and we're very focused. We're asking the right questions. So yeah, I'm, I'm biased in that regard because there's too much choice today. And consumers can find it all. So you know, you have an opportunity now, if you can create a point of difference in your product and who you are as a brand and your reason for being, they'll find you. That's the purple cow. They'll find you because you know, they, they can find you on the web. That wasn't the case 20 years ago. You had to get a retailer convinced. So, I'm, I'm pretty biased on that score, but that's kind of where I've lived most of my career, too. I, so would it be safe to say then, when you sat down and, and uh, first envisioned what you were going to do, you decided you, how you were going to improve, improve the product. Absolutely. And then as you allocated funds to do that, your funds were into your product first. Not Absolutely. The first year we cut all of our advertising, we were dark. We didn't run one ad. It, ads don't sell. <coughs> They do create brand, they let people get to know you, but they don't sell shoes. Depends, depends who they are. So we've done a lot of market work and, and kind of getting to know runners and then watching them doing some survey work. There's alpha runners. You are one of those. You're not going to switch your shoe. You love your shoe. Very unlikely you'll switch your shoe unless you get injured or something like that or some friend or doctor tells you you ought to try this. You might try something, but not likely. And then in the whole fitness runner category, there's multi-sport athletes that are skiers or basketball players, but they run to train. And they don't say they're runners, but they might actually run quite a bit. There are holistic um, athletes that are you know, really about doing a lot of different things and mind, body, and soul and being healthy. And there are these committed goal seekers that woke up one day and, and whatever the impetus was, a challenge or raising money or a life-changing you know, event, um, they just signed up for a marathon or a 200 mile bike race, or something they've never done before. And those, so there, we've, we've actually done a lot of segmenting and we've got marketing programs that are, that are absolutely designed to each of those different audiences. And we've actually identified on paper where we think the three million are gonna come from and how we're gonna get them. But it's, you know, it is about creating trial and it is about key influencers in every case. And so we have a PR machine um, that we get, we get more impressions in the core lifestyle fitness running magazines than almost any other brand. We work it really hard. So it's, you know, we're trying to get visible to runners where they are and, and uh, we're in the health clubs. We have a uh, co-marketing relationship with Lifetime Fitness that has almost two million members and it's in the Midwest. And you know, we, we have a lot of different things going on, but you know, that's the challenge for us. We're not gonna do it with an advertising budget. We're gonna be in the core magazines, but you know, the running magazines, but we're, we're not, we can't compete with those guys. We have to do it different. So, Jeff? Jeff, how did you overcome the stigma of having the shoes? You know, it's, it, it happened faster than I thought it could. It really did. But, 
part of it is just not being there anymore. And I think with a lot of customers, you know, we're still that. That's who we are. A lot of people that don't know us, maybe they've never been into where our shoes are now distributed, still see us as that. Um, so I don't think we've totally left it. But with the intensity that we're, we're, we're approaching the running category in core distribution from sporting goods stores to finish line in the malls to even Nordstrom and REI and the outdoor side, and of course these running shops, the intensity with which we're, we're approaching that has made them fans of our brand. We're well positioned there, so we're part of their mix. And we're creating so much heat there that it's allowing us to be successful. We haven't, we haven't fixed this issue over here, but it's fading over time. You know, I really believe over time you are what you sell, who you sell it to, and how you sell it. So for the last seven years, we've been a performance running company. And if we keep on that course, you know, that's what we'll be to everybody as they touch our brand, see our brand, connect with our brand. So it's it's daunting task, but I think fortunately we had a toehold in running and running has taken off. We look brilliant now because it's been it's been a boom in running, frankly. I mean it's been a very strong category and now we're very well positioned in that category. Yeah? Do you think that being environmentally responsible gives you guys a competitive edge? So how do you raise awareness to that attribute when it comes to your consumers? You know, we we're not sure it's gonna be a Competitive edge down the road. We think it's going to be expected, you know, and that's why we've gone open technology on this. We think it's going to be expected of, of people that sell running product, just like it is, I think, of people that sell product for the outdoors. You know, if you're ex if, and, and people that come to a resort like this, it becomes expected. So, you know, as we started down this path, it wasn't to create a unique competitive advantage that no one else could duplicate. Frankly, I think. Nike is a great industry leader on this stuff. They truly are, and they're the lightning rod for everybody, you know, from a criticism standpoint, but they've got programs that, that are just doing fabulous things on sustainability in, at the factory level and at the company level, and their problems obviously are a lot bigger than ours. So, you know, we're, not, we're, tr we're trying to move as fast as we can, and when we accomplish something, we put it on our website, um, but we're not wearing it on our sleeve. We're not you know, badging the product as green because it's not yet. The next season we've got, you know, um, recycled laces. We've got some other materials in the upper that have now been recycled, but a lot of it is still virgin and, and material and we're not there yet. So, you know, but I, we think over time it's, it's going to be a, a price to do business. And there are a lot of regulations coming in the EU that are forcing you know, an ingredient list on hazardous materials in the product that are also going to be really powerful, I think, for everybody to make, you know, more environmentally friendly product and the like. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, we think it's important. And, and when we've achieved something, we think we should put it on our website. But we don't see it um, being that different from other companies that get on the path. If you don't get on the path, you're going to look different by exclusion. Um, and, and we think consumers will care about that. Whether they'll pay for it, you know, two years ago the conventional wisdom, and Michael would have a better sense of this at REI, but is they really won't. You know, that was our sense of it. Now, you know, I'm not so sure they won't pay a little bit more for it, um, but we don't, we don't have any data at all on that. So, yeah? Just so you're talking about how, you know, the running taken off, and I just wondered in your marketing and messaging, uh, are you guys just kind of writing that? You know, we think we've really captured a different energy than any other brand has. It's inspiring everybody to run and be active. We're celebrating the run. We're, we're trying to encourage people to get out there, whether you're a six-hour marathoner or a two-and-a-half-hour marathoner. It's all about being out there. And, and we're, we're sort of an everybody brand. It's kind of a populist energy to this brand, and it's always been that way recently. The pe and the people that are attracted to Brooks are that way. So it's being who we are. But we also believe it resonates more, you know, with the fitness runners that are coming into the sport most recently than, you know, an athletic energy. Because not how many people are out there to break the tape or, or beat their personal best? There's just not that many guys like Jeff out there. They're out there, but the vast majority of people are out there because it makes them feel good. They're losing a little bit of weight. They can have a beer on Friday night if they get their run in. They they want to raise money. Their you know great friend died of disease and they've got 30 people out there raising and, and money in their honor and, and it's it's 
there is so much going on in running that's positive, and um, you know that's what we're trying to connect with and represent because um, that's all we are. We're not you know we're not a basketball company. We're we're not an athletic company. It's part of running, but it's 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 not the center of gravity of running anymore. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's um, that's the energy that we think our brand can connect with because that's who we are. Very cool. They're very cool. Um, you know, <coughs> Under Armour is a great story. What, a, what, a, what an incredible um, brand and, and uh, company story. In a 10-year period, they've created an unbelievable energy on the athletic fields, and especially with high school kids. And it's not just football. It's, it's all across the athletic fields. And, and they've come from base layer into a brand, and they've just done a great job of it. Um, you know, in many respects, they're the hottest company in football right now. And football is a big sport. It's a million kids in high school, and it's the number one participation sport in high school. And it's just got great mojo right now. Football is really strong. So they're going head to head with Nike there, and they're doing a great job. And they came with cleats. Now they've got a cross trainer out, um, and it's and it's okay. And cross training is a small category. It's kind of a hybrid shoe. Um, and, and what's happened to it since Bo Jackson is it went away because if you're really going to play basketball, you should have a basketball shoe because it's pivoting and it's, it's got support in certain areas. And if you're really going to run, you ought to have a running shoe um, because it's got support and blah, blah, blah. So cross training, they, they have a shot at single-handedly resurrecting that category. And, um, and, and I think they'll have some success at it. They're coming with running a year from now. They'll have running in spring 09. And, um, and so, you know, what do I, I, I think they're going to be successful in footwork. I think they'll definitely be a, a factor there. It's not easy. Um, you know, I've talked to a few football coaches in their third season. They're terrible. They're falling apart. They won't let the kids wear them. You hear a lot, of course. But it's actually hard to make a great shoe. It, you know, a shoe is a shoe is a shoe. It's actually really hard to make a great cleat, a great running shoe, a great hiking light hiker. It's, it's to make, get it to fit and feel great and all that. There's, there's a lot of good shoes out there. There's only a few great shoes in every category. So, you know, whether or not they'll be successful at really making great product is yet to be seen. But they'll sell a lot of shoes, and, and, um, and I think the product's respectable. That's, that's what the industry believes. So. Can I get a question? Is, is the rum the sale point uh, in Europe and in Asia as it is in the U.S.? Absolutely, you know, running, what's, what's exciting about our category too is that it's truly a global category. It, anywhere that people can afford leisure time or, or athletic activity, running is part of that culture. So, you know, we're very strong in Europe, Scandinavia. Australia is our number one uh, country on a per capita basis. It's a sports crazy country and we do very well there. We're very, very strong. If we were, if we had that per capita market share everywhere, we'd be triple our size. We're very strong down under. Doing very well in South America. The economies there are getting very strong. Um, and we've had, because we're 90, year old, 90 years old plus, we've had um, some international distributors for going on 30 years. So in some respects, we've had better brand continuity in countries outside the US than we've had here. We had more churn and more faces to the marketplace here over the last 30 years than we have in some other countries. So we. Uh, 45% of our overall revenue is international, outside the U.S. Yes? Uh, I was just wondering, where are your top factories located, and have you had any business partners that have not been experienced with uh, Yeah, I'm not sleeping anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's so dynamic in China right now. It's been, you know, called the perfect storm. So we're, our footwear factories are in southern China, which is where the whole footwear industry is really headquartered. And the factories are world class. They're very clean, well lit, great technology, highly skilled workers. Um, running shoes have probably 70 components in them, and there's a lot of make. And every time you make a shoe, you got to make it 12 sizes men, 12 sizes women. There's tooling galore. So there's a lot of engineering and, and mill work and tooling involved in, in creating one style of shoe. All that's in southern China. So what's happened in the last year has been just amazing. First of all, the government made several changes. They reduced the export tax credits. They want high tech along the coast. They want 
shoes and apparel and textiles in the interior. Um, they've weighed, raised the minimum wage. They've increased social insurance costs for retirement and health care, all of which is incredibly exciting for China. You know, for all the naysayers on the sweatshops um, and what's happening in the Asian countries, the middle class there is absolutely booming and the society is coming up and it looks like LA. It looks like an industrial Los Angeles. It's amazing how it's changed in 10 years. So costs are rising dramatically. Um, labor is a com significant component. That alone is not you know, going to hurt us because you know, we're a premium product. We're not trying to sell it $12 retail. Um, but you couple with that $130 oil, just about all the components and shipping it around and so on and so forth are petroleum based. Um, the fact that the US dollar is in an absolute tailspin. And um, we are trying to figure out how fast we can raise prices um, for spring 09. And obviously, those have been baked now. We just launched um, that product line to retail in the last two weeks. But our costs are going up anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. And, um, and, and that's new. That's a whole new experience. I was in, uh, I made a trip over to China and Vietnam in the last um, 90 days and uh, meeting with several major factories. One, YY, is one of the largest footwear producers in the world. Over 200 million pairs of shoes make for Nike, Adidas. They make for everybody. Um, he said, you know, there was a, a manufacturing miracle that occurred in China. It's happened. It's done. It's over. And, and the, the world of, of increasing productivity, lower costs, lower prices is, is changed probably forever. And certainly we see it that way because we can't chase low labor all over the world because we can't get the quality and the materials and, and all the infrastructure. It's just not something that happens that fast. So absolute huge changes going on in China. Um, it's amazing and it's happening at light speed. You know, that government, when they stand up and decide to do something, it happens right now. And, uh, and so the disruptions in our category are absolutely huge and everybody's scrambling with it. We certainly are. Okay, on that note, I'd like to ask you to put your hands together to thank Jim. <laughs>